Isambard Kingdom Brunel uh, was of course the um, engineer, designer, creator of the wonderful Great Western Railway from um, Bristol to London and I say Bristol to London because the um, it originated in Bristol the idea was to link the western port to London to speed up the transfer of merchandise um, and he approached it in his very uh, distinctive innovative uh, manner and he looked around at various railways that were under construction particularly uh, the London and Birmingham railway and um, he thought he could do very much better. He travelled on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first intercity railway ever built in the world, and uh, he felt at the time that the ride was very rough and that um, the speeds were comparatively low, though of course much faster than the contemporary um, uh, horse-drawn carriages on the dreadful roads of the time. So he looked at the uh, problem and he chose a different approach. First of all, he decided that the width between the rails, the gauge, was far too narrow. It was based upon um, the old wagonways of the northeast of England and um, at about four foot eight and three quarter inches, um, what is now termed standard gauge. Uh, but he decided that was far too narrow. So uh, rather than following along uh, those horse-drawn uh, little lines, largely horse-drawn lines, um, he adopted a gauge of seven feet. So the the gauge, because it would be a wider gauge, it would mean that the distance, uh, obviously the distance between the rails, is determines the height and width of the rolling stock because of the centre of gravity. And um, uh, so he decided that four foot eight and a half inches or four foot eight and five eighths inches were just was just too narrow. Now George Stevenson had used it for the Stockton and Darlington Railway of 1825 and for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway 1830 Liverpool and Manchester Railway not 1825 as I said earlier um, but it's based upon the gauge of short horse-drawn wagonways um, hauling coal um, from, the, from, the, from the coal mines in his um, native northeast of England and um, Frankly, uh, these were just used as feeder lines to take coal down the hillsides to the canals and the rivers. Uh, also, longer horse-drawn lines, uh, completely freight orientated, like the Surrey Iron Railway, which was just a moved at the speed of a walking horse. And uh, what they tended to use were um, stone blocks. That's that's sort of stone cubes with a um, hole drilled in the top into which a a wooden peg was driven and then um, a rail which was either L-shaped that is the flange was on the rail um, these were then um, nailed into those stone blocks there would be a parallel two, uh, a parallel two parallel lines of stone blocks and the rails would be fitted to those uh, very primitively uh, later the innovation um, came that instead of having stone blocks you used um, sleepers or wooden cross ties uh, every few, every couple of feet and you would fix the rails to these and that's the, the familiar type of track that we know today but v there was very little of that that was an innovation at the time that Brunel was considering in the late 1830s was considering uh, creating his unique uh, railway and um, he was uh, determined to go back to first principles and uh, so his, he wanted to to move away from uh, the influence of Stevenson and the those early railways uh, because they were essentially wagonways onto which steam locomotives had been fitted and the rails had been improved enough the flange had moved from the rail to the wheel and so they were edge rails and um, so, uh, that, that, but it was still very much limited by the technology of stone blocks and iron rails, which really meant that the the um, the rails, which are iron, obviously um, wrought iron, um, some cast iron. The original wagonways had cast iron rails, which were very brittle. So, um, basically, Brunel was faced with wanting a, a high speed, big. Uh, carriages uh, wide and tall 
and um, so he needed a reliable permanent way which is the name we give to uh, the actual railway it's the railed way and rail rail comes from the use uh, the term for a long pole um, usually a shaped pole that was used as part of a fencing and that was a rail and then these uh, the metal pieces just mimic those that was the local that was the contemporary name for those sort of shapes and so that's why we've got railways or railroads whichever that one you want to call it um what he when he was when he was thinking about this um and this and uh, preparing for it he looked back to this well, to this period to the 1830s uh, when he gave evidence to the 1845 Royal Commission Railway Gauges and he said at that um, commission he gave quite a long, lot of evidence he said looking to the speeds which I contemplated would be adopted on railways because he thought these railways generally would go much faster and the masses are to be moved and that's in the technical sense of mass it doesn't mean lots of people it just means in the sheer mass the the uh, bulk and weight to be to be moved it seemed to me that the whole machine was too small for the work to be done and that it required that the parts should be on a scale more commensurate with the mass and the velocity to be attained. I think the impression grew upon me gradually, Brunel carried on, so that it is difficult to fix the time when I first thought a wide gauge would be uh, desirable. Um, but I dare say there were stages between wishing that it could be so and determining to try and do it. And he made a number of arguments about the benefits of the broad gauge. He said, well, first of all, it would reduce friction frictional resistance of the wheels on the rails because you would use larger diameter wheels therefore they'd make fewer turns now this might seem really a bit of a specious argument today given the high quality of the steels that we use both on railway wheels and rails themselves but back then with cast iron wheels and wrought iron rails which as I say were quite brittle for the time um, this had a major influence and it was had to be considered these guys are finding their way uh, how to uh, develop railways also he said there would be a lower centre of gravity which meant that you could mount the carriage and the wa wagon bodies within the wheels rather than on top of them and that's pretty obvious if you've got wheels 7 foot apart if you've got a 6 foot wide uh, carriage body it could actually sit just above the axles and the wheels would be actually uh, protruding above the lower edge of the carriage um, so long as you didn't have any doors there you were fine uh, but on a narrow gauge that is what we call a standard gauge now four foot eight and a half you have to put the bodies above the uh, upper edge of the wheels uh, because they extend wider than the axles so also this would allow larger and more powerful engines therefore you could have higher speeds and longer trains and also the the other aspect he stressed um, to the Royal Commission was that the broad gauge gave much greater stability um, trains weren't going to jump off too quickly um, because there was a lower centre of gravity um, he said yeah of course there would be problems with making junctions with other lines because they're not at the same gauge so you can't run them uh, across and this is actually a key factor which I'll come back to um, in 1835 the Great Western Railway was considering to uh, approach London and then from the west and then swing round the northern towards the northwest and then come in and use Euston Station which was being um, laid out by the London and Birmingham Railway and um, but the whole the whole aspect um, of that the agreement collapsed and so GWR had to, had to end up making its own London terminus and of course this fitted uh, Brunel's concept of using a different gauge very conveniently and it ended up of course where the land uh, which had been purchased ran out which is which is what we now call Paddington just by Trade Street and uh, the original terminus was a very uh, was basically just where the rails came to an end but what about um, the railway itself uh, well he looked at the London Birmingham railway how it was laying out its railway and it was using stone blocks just like the old wagon ways and short lengths uh, maybe five six foot long of rail and so from one block to the next there would be this sort of rail and often they would have a fish belly to them that is um, they, the underside of the rail would um, belly down um, in a curve in order to give it greater structural integrity to, to hopefully stop it uh, 
um, cracking um, while in use and broken rails was uh, um, one of the many problems that faced these early railways the received wisdom of the time was that was that you had to create the firmest possible permanent way um, in other words when you fitted your railway uh, you didn't want it to move to either side because obviously if you were using two lines of stone blocks if one block line of blocks moves off to one in one direction and the other to the another then you're going to be out of gauge very quickly and trains is going to run down into the gap between the two and conversely of course if they move towards each other uh, one side moves in and then it's going to cause a lot of problem a lot of screeching and a rapid um, braking or deceleration of any train moving on it so you don't want it to move from either side also you don't want it to move up and down and that relies of course on how well it's bedded into the into the ground and so it was assumed that the the, 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 the way track should be built was it had to be anchored down and held rigid in the ground as, as hard as possible uh, and so that meant that um, Brunel who accepted these um, these assumptions of the time he devised a very rigid a very firm permanent way that would not allow it to uh, spread uh, the gauge either side or to move up and down at all now of course we now know today um, and indeed it was learnt during this Victorian period that what you need is uh, some flexibility uh, you do need uh, not so much from side for the rails to move in different directions either side but so that the track itself the rails and the cross sleepers can as it were uh, move up and down and just a bit of flexibility and you, you achieve that um, both by the construction of um, a traditional type of railway with sleepers and chairs and rails and also you don't pack the ballast in absolutely as tight as you possibly can so there's a little bit of movement there but the f that's flexibility which was only a discovery uh, as the experience of the Victorians um, as they became more experienced about this it meant that you had to have stronger and more pliant rails iron wasn't going to do it current wrought iron rails at the time that Brunel was devising the Great Western just wouldn't have been capable of this they would have snapped they wouldn't have, have flexed and of course until really until um, Bessemer um, produced his um, reliable and consistent conversion process to create um, steel from about 1865 onwards that's after um, Brunel's death um, it's only then that you get the rise of steel rails which are sufficiently strong and yet flexible um, to lay out a um, uh, to lay out a, a modern style uh, railway rail road so uh, Brunel used the his railway design was using basic raw, raw, uh, using basic engineering principles and he worked within had to work within the current limitations of the uh, manufacture of iron so he ended up with a wrought iron bridge rails that is a bridge rail in cross section if you cut a slice of a bridge rail it looks like a bridge and so it's um, it uh, would have flattened again looking at the cross section if you're taking a slice across a piece of, of the bridge rail um, <coughs> the um, two sides are flattened down so they can be fixed to um, <coughs> whatever is going to support the rails and um, and then there, there'll be two sides so it'll be hollow it'll be two sides to it and they come up to the top and, and obviously join together at the top and that is the surface on which the wheels run but it's like a bridge now they are um, that's about the best you could get at the time as far as that particular design was concerned now they, they were fine they even had a bit of flexibility in them but there's no way that you could use cross sleepers to support bridge rails uh, in that way you had to give them continuous support underneath all the length of the way so Brunel devised a type of track which uh, is unique to him underneath each of the rails for the whole length of the rails there would be a longitudinal wooden um, support what he called a bulk that's B-A-U-L-K and that would be continuous timber support as wherever the rail ran obviously two rails to make the track there would be underneath those each of those rails would be a continuous um, wooden bulk and 
which would they that would replace all of those um, stone blocks, which was the sort of like cutting edge technology of the time. And uh, he would um, make sure that it kept the gauge; they didn't move apart, splay out, or move in, by putting cross bulks about every fifteen feet along the track. So you've got something that looks very different to modern railway track. You've got these uh, rails supported all the way along by wooden balks and then cross transoms, as they're called, every 15 feet. They're not sleepers, they don't support the track, all they do is keep the gauge. And then every time there was a junction between, or join, bit of the rails, when one piece of uh, bridge rail was then butted onto the end of the next piece, underneath that would that would form a joint obviously and um, the vertical position of the of the track that is if you sort of you know sat down in the middle of a railway line and look put your eye along the line of the rail so you're uh, uh, you know not don't do this at home don't do this on a railway line uh, what, you, what you'd want to do is make sure that your um, your rail road or railway uh, was conforming to the gradients which you devised as an engineer uh, so in order to do that you wanted it to be vertically fixed it couldn't shift up and down um, uh, any, in any direction because otherwise then you get all sorts of um, um, all sorts of effects and I think it's actually if you ever get to see look it up on YouTube Buster Keaton um, Modern times, or the neighbours, or something. Anyway, he goes on a, on a sort of a putative railway journey in the 1850s, and it does exactly that. It moves up and down quite a bit. So, what does Brunel do? Well, he puts, he decides that every time there's a, a, a junction between the uh, one butt end, when he puts another piece of rail in underneath there, he's going to put a big pile, a vertical pile, underneath that joint. So, there's a piece of wood underneath the track and then that's like the, cr the top part of a T and then the, the vertical part of the T is this enormous pile which he would drive down six foot or more down into the ground and that would support it so there'd be no uh, vertical movement whatsoever once he'd set the, set the um, gradient that was it whether it was level or not and in many ways um, you know this was the basis of his uh, uh, what they call Brunel's billiard table because uh, one of the things about Great Western was and is that its gradients are so so shallow virtually level so much of its way very very shallow uh, gradients very high speed running possible and he wanted to maintain that by these vertical piles which nailed the track to the ground very effectively well, uh, there's there's some possibility that he um, based some of these ideas on his father's um, design for the um, uh, Chatham Dockyard railway line, which was used inside the, uh, the Royal Navy Dockyard at Chatham for moving timbers about. So Mark Brunel had, had, had devised a seven-foot line for Chatham Dock, Dockyard. And it's almost certain that, that his, his son obviously had seen it I don't think he actually worked on it. I think it had been finished long before he was um, old enough to appreciate that. But he was certainly known about it and perhaps saw his father's drawings and, and you know, got the spark of genius from that. The thing was, though, with Brunel's Bulk Road um, is that um, it was much more complicated to lay at the time than, than traditional stone blocks. I mean, if you think about it, you just turn up with a load of cut stone cubes put them along in a line, a curve or a straight line, um, make sure you drilled holes in the top, whack in a wooden plug, bring your rails along and they just connect up from one block to the other. Um, so they're like little bridges if you like going from one block to the next and you just nail or screw in your uh, the flanges at the end of each bit of rail and then put the next bit in and those rails are only going to be about three four foot long they're really quite small uh, but Brunel's bulk road meant that you could use longer lengths of wrought iron bridge rail uh, which was actually more economic but um, it was much more complicated to produce the road than um, the railroad the railway than the stone blocks nine rails 
and you had to know what you're doing you had to know how to assemble it all the pieces had to be prepared um, he had them um, soaked all the wood was soaked in a solution of mercuric chloride which was known as kyanizing um, which was after the the guy who developed it Mr. Kyan K-Y-A-N kyanized um, which was meant to be a preservative and they had great baths at, at places like West Drayton and so on where they had this wood soaking in it for as long so uh, I suppose you know, a bit like the old tar or something like that anyway um it was it was so it was complicated to produce but it was economic because you didn't um the iron was um uh, simpler to produce and you used a lot of timber which was relatively cheap uh if it had been a traditional later cross timbered cross sleepered railway you'd have had to have used much more wood for the sleepers and especially the technology would have had to have developed for the much heavier rail so this idea that we have the railways looking as they do today with sleepers, rails and chairs that is definitely a development of the later 19th century and uh, way beyond anything that Brunel um, had available to him so that's what he built and initially when they started operating um, equipment on the railway um, locomotives and early carriages this is before it's open to the, even to the public the initial operation was really disastrous and it looked like Brunel had really put his foot in it it was very rough and uneasy sort of uneven running certainly not even as smooth as the stone blocks and iron rails uh, which themselves were pretty notorious for being quite a bumpy ride um, and so Brunel looked at this and he realised that um, there's a number of there are two key areas of problems first of all the actual carriages themselves had very inadequate springs uh, and um, because they'd relied on road coach builders traditional methods so they had to devise uh, more effective um, leaf springs for that and also um, the early earliest carriages were just four wheelers and a four wheel ca four wheel carriage will definitely reflect every bump and and uh, and uh, judder of the rails and so um, it, that particular aspect improving the springing of the early carriages and going over a six wheel carriage this is long before the idea of bogey carriages of course um, that really um, aided the carriage side and the other side he looked at was that the, the longitudinals that is the t timbers that ran underneath the rails um, they hadn't been really he felt the ballasting looking at that the ballasting needed improvement so uh, they, re they actually had been using very fine ballast and it also must be said some of the contractors had been using a lot of old rubbish and so that was all hooked out and it was repacked with a graded coarser ballast which is which was very much like the sort of ballast we would expect to see on the railway today also um, after a little bit of another couple of months because that improved the running considerably he then realized that the vertical piles that he'd had driven down into the ground six feet or more by um, by the contractors when they're building the railway and laying the wet lay in the track, he said. Right, he, he sort of looked at it and he said to, I think it was in a conversation with Gooch that rather than, than actually pinning down the longitudinal timbers to the ground, they acted like the piers of a bridge. So between each each um, section of rail, <coughs> it, they sort of encouraged the ballast there to sort of fall away, and they stood firm and proud but then he, every time you went over one of those vertical pile joints uh, the next bit of track the middle of the rail was um, as it were hanging high or not actually hanging high but less well supported so the way to do it was to remove the vertical piles and inadvertently of course that meant that he was producing a much more flexible uh, railway albeit with longitudinal um, balks under the rails rather than cross sleepers but that dramatically improved the running as well and but even as the Great Western was beginning to open in sections um, it was uh, improving in its um, in its running and uh, they, they were removing the work they'd done previously uh, but there we are, I mean that's the nature of an innovative um, any sort of innovative um, development that you've got to put up with uh, you know, uh, learning as you go You're, you, you are the pioneer 
Uh, and of course the other aspect about the broad gauge is that as the Great Western Railway expanded, it built its line from Bristol to London, London to Bristol, and uh, then it promoted other lines and took over those lines eventually. So it promoted and <coughs> eventually took over the Bristol and Exeter line, um, and then on down through <coughs> to the South Devon, and I'll draw a veil over the atmospheric um, experiment there. Um, but also it took over some of the South Wales railways, or at least made contact with South Wales railways, and then on into Cornwall as well, and um, up to Cheltenham. So it's expanding its territory. And as soon as it does do that, it begins to make contact with lines using other gauges, particularly the narrower gauge. And this meant um, that, that um, goods and passengers had to get off the broad gauge train and be carried over to um, the narrow gauge train in order to continue their journey. And um, this led to the so-called gauge wars, which was a series of disputes between these com competing companies. Now, they are commercial enterprises. They're there to make money. And the disputes eventually led to uh, a Royal Commission on Railway Gauges, which took place in 1845, which I've mentioned before. And Brunel um, gave uh, evidence, along with a number of others. And um, it was rather curious because the Commission tended to concentrate, frankly, I think, if you look at the material, on, on the wrong issues. Uh, because first of all, they decided that they would um, have a look at the, uh, make comparisons between broad and narrow gauge locomotives. And so they ran these, and it was one hands down by a broad gauge Firefly class loco Ixion. And um, it's much more powerful and much able to achieve much higher speeds. Uh, and then it also it, it concentrated on the on the most sort of um, the uh, break of gauge, the transfer between two different companies. Uh, the most notorious one, which was lampooned with cartoons and all the rest of it, um, at Gloucester. And this was largely a setup. This was a um, a propaganda campaign against the Great Western Railway because by building broad gauge, it meant that. Uh, all the territory that the Great Western had couldn't, you couldn't then get running powers from a narrow gauge um, company onto the broad gauge track unless you also had broad gauge engines and wagons. And the whole thing about this was um, there were so many companies being uh, established at the time, they're all out to utilize other people's assets. So whenever there's a break of gauge, it meant that the narrow gauge company couldn't invade the territory of the Great Western unless it it, it also um, bought some narrow, uh, some broad gauge engines and wagons and passenger carriages. So standard gauge, so-called standard gauge advocates, it's little to do with um, the uh, so-called inconvenience at Gloucester or wherever, wherever the two gauges met, because people were quite happy to transfer between different road coaches for example going um, up the uh, Great Great North Road and then they have to catch another carriage to go out to um, you know off the route of the Great North Road or if they come to a, to a port to transfer from a carriage to a little a little boat to go across the channel or wherever so this was very much a commercial attack on the Great Western Railway a propaganda campaign and um, one, because once the Great Western allowed standard gauge uh, third rail to be added to the na to the broad gauge so that standard gauge uh, trains or narrow gauge trains um, could run on um, on its routes as well and by acquiring running powers through its act of parliament against the great western um, then it meant it was in competition directly in competition with the great western for traffic on that great western route uh, well, what did the what did the broad gauge uh, what did the gauge commissioners do? Well, the, their report recommended the adoption of a narrow of the narrow gauge. Um, and this would be enforced by law. It noted there's a there were 274 route miles of broad gauge, and almost 2,000 route miles of um, of um, narrow gauge. But they weren't really comparing like for like because the broad gauge quickly established itself as very much safer, very much faster, very much more comfortable than the um, the wretched little wagon way gauge that um, is the so-called standard gauge as far as um, Britain is concerned, four for eight and a half. Um, 
So it was a de facto victory for the standard gauge, but also it was still a bit of a fudge because um, you could lay a third rail on broad gauge lines and some narrow gauge lines had to have a broad gauge line added to it as well. Uh, but it did encourage the creation of long distance networks of, of lines. But of course that only followed as these individual companies bought each other out, took over each other. So it was very much to do with commercial competition um, and building up railway empires um, of the like of the Midland than it was anything to do with the um, uh, benefits of broad or narrow gauge. Broad gauge was eventually eliminated in 1892. Uh, widespread gauge conversion of the Great Western Railway over one of the August, uh, an August weekend in 1892. Riddell did give some answers to the criticisms uh, that he faced at the um, Royal Commission on the um, on the gauge question. Um, and for example he said well look breaks of gauge occurred at natural frontiers between regions um, which were largely devoted to different activities for example farming act uh, manufacturing or mining a um, bit of a general one that one not quite sure about it um, but he said also um, through working of passenger services were very unlikely except um, perhaps to London therefore changing trains would be a normal part of rail travel and it certainly if you wanted a, to go to any sort of branch line, um, when it, all the when all the, the lines were more or less all the lines were four foot eight and a half inches, um, you still had to change onto a branch train. It could have been any gauge you like, uh, and certainly as far as here in Ireland, um, it's, so I'm, I'm recording this in Belfast, um, is concerned, um, Ireland had a, a secondary, a narrow gauge, a, a three foot gauge, and its normal standard gauges. Is um, is uh, is uh, five foot uh, three, and um, so uh, whenever you wanted to go off, say to Donegal, um, you had to change trains anyway onto a narrow gauge. So in some senses, uh, Brunel was pointing out the fact that it's more about uh, commercial competition than it is about the actual through running of services. Um, the carriage of freight would be won by the most competitive line. Uh, that was his argument and he's suggesting that he's moving into the sort of commercial composition that there was and he said where where any transfer was required he said all we need to do is use transferable wagon bodies that is containers Contain he was suggesting containerization long before it was even thought of uh, and he said for example containers already in in 1845 were transferring um, uh, coal by crane uh, from the ships in containers, um, basically big um, boxes, um, onto the Bristol and Exeter Railway. And um, freight containers could encourage uh, companies to build suitable vehicles and transfer equipment. And any gauge could use it, any gauge at all could use it, broad, narrow, anything you like. Uh, road vehicles on ships, whatever. So long before, a hundred years, before anybody's really getting into containerization. Um, Brunel suggesting it as a way not just of ameliorating the break of gauge but also speeding freight uh, along through all different transport systems and that's classic of Brunel very visionary um, and he said well you know if, if the narrow gauge wagons had to, to enter broad gauge territory then okay we can build broad gauge transporter wagons onto which narrow gauge wagons could be run using a ramp and again um, not unheard of uh, subsequently in uh, railway operation in the British Isles and throughout the world. So really this whole business about the break of gauge and the gauge commission was something of a um, uh, something of a commercial uh, design by the com competitors of the Great Western to force their way into onto the routes that the Great Western had established and to cream off some of their profits uh, and also to be in direct competition and of course subsequently um, companies like the um, uh, let's, let's think now it's the the one that ran down from Gloucester down to the south coast um, these sort of these sort of different uh, companies would, get, would join up say with the Midland Midland Southwestern can I say the Midland Southwestern Railway which ran down and was a largely created uh, with, with Midland backing Midland railway money um, and to, to directly compete with the Great Western and cut through the Great Western territory 
So there we are. Anyway, that's a look at Brunel's brilliant, I think, raw gauge track and the way he devised it in the 1830s, long before any techn technology and materials were available for producing the modern type sleeper rail chair system that we have today and um, trying to solve the problems that the uh, railways of the time faced uh, to achieve higher speed running and 60 mile an hour express is not unknown very er from very early on in the days of the Great Western much bigger carriages uh, little examples for example uh, for a little example uh, of it would be f uh, say uh, on the horse boxes the horses travelled not um, uh, side by side facing towards the direction of travel but but um, across the gauge so the heads are on one side of the the um, the horse box and the tail on the platform side which it was certainly easy to get them into the vehicle and indeed to get them out um, you could also what else did they do well they loaded uh, horse drawn carriages onto carriage trucks so you put your horses into a horse box your carriage onto a carriage truck you got into a luxurious first class for the time that is uh, luxurious first class carriage and your servants got into a third class or second or third class carriage added on and then you had a luggage van added on to that and your essentially your own private train if you had the money and the social standing was then added to um, the end of the next train coming along uh, the next fast train coming along to the Great West on the, at your Great Western station and of course Brunel devised a special type of uh, turntable and and platform to create just that bespoke personal first class service uh, for his very superior Great Western <laughs> Railway and that probably maybe I'll cover that in a later video so there we are that's something about Brunel's Broad Gauge Railway I hope it's been of interest to you if it has um, please do um, subscribe to my channel ING for trains uh, which perversely stands for Irish narrow gauge for trains but there you go ING for trains and um, leave, give me a thumbs up um, if you've got any queries or questions or comments please do post them on YouTube uh, always pleased to hear from from, um, from people and um, hope you uh, look out for my next video uh, which could be something else about the brilliant Isambard Kingdom Brunel <laughs>